I wrote this this morning. Despite the glamour and tease of instant enlightenment, it usually takes time for the self to unwind, for the nervous system to release and relax. It takes time and patience, resolve and surrender for the old patterns deeply embedded to come undone. Amoda Ma, my wife, teacher, had a profound awakening moment back in 2002. An experience of great magnitude for her that shifted her life and changed everything really from that moment on. She saw something. She saw the mechanism of mind and something in that experience unhooked her, you might say, from that mechanism of mind. And really from then on, she's remained unhooked from the mechanism of mind. I'm speaking words to her experience, which is often not fair really in some ways, but and probably maybe not accurate. Obviously, it's not the way she would speak it, but that's what, that's what we've got. So, <clears throat> of course, still she, you know, has had experiences since then where that unhooking from the mechanism of mind, you know, has met the human experience and you know, still the human experience continues. But what I'm really talking about, what I am speaking to for a bit this morning, is that despite the glamour and tease and desire and picture we have of instant enlightenment, for most, and this is my experience as well, the path is gradual. I talk about the erosion of the cliff, the cliff being the cliff of self. Hard in many ways, full of edges, solid. And the journey, the gradual path, is the path of erosion of that cliff into the ocean of being, into the ocean of awareness, into the ocean of love. And that gradual path takes time, of course. It takes persistence. It takes certain resilience. It takes great surrender. And it takes, of course, our sense of failure because often we have some kind of breakthrough, maybe, and then we experience the return of the triggers or the return of the self or the return of the, you know, the agitation. And, and that causes a sense of failure. But on the path, the gradual path, there can be no sense of failure. Failure, come on, boy, boy. Failure is a teacher. In many ways, failure is one of the great teachers on the spiritual path, and we don't give it enough credit. If you don't see everything as a, a sort of right and wrong, if you don't actually yield to the failure, and, but, but actually see it as a doorway, you know something opens some deeper equanimity opens. You know, in failure is humility. Yeah, in failure, there's a small humiliation of the self that wants to get everything right. And that humiliation can obviously lead to great trouble, which it does for the self. 
but on the path of awakening or on the path of uh, transformation, uh, humiliation. Do you mind? <laughs> I've got a crazy dog here. Humiliation can lead us to humility. And I do like to talk about humility. Humility is one of the great qualities that we have. It's not weak. Humility is actually very strong. It's just quite soft, that's all. But on the gradual path, yes. Um, it's sort of... It forges something. It's funny with the gradual path because it's not really as much destination oriented as the expectation and hope that when you know one day I'm going to be free because I'm going to get instant enlightenment. It's sort of, you know, throw that away, I say. Cast that aside. It's a carrot. It's a tease. It's a lure. And of course, the, you know, some things need to be there to give us a, a certain momentum on the journey. And there does need to be a momentum on the journey. I was talking about this the other day. Momentum is a very good thing, you know, a very necessary quality. But momentum need not necessarily have anything to do with the idea of a destination. Momentum for its own sake. Momentum because you love unraveling the lies. And you love meeting the truth, even if it hurts, because it so often does. That's why I talk about, you know, discomfort and the shadow and the pain and the sorrow and the grief. You know, because all of these are doorways, but they do need to be met. You know, the psychology of a Western seeker is complex. There are many layers. You know, we've been heavily conditioned into, you know, this leela, into this play. And it takes great courage and willingness and surrender and humility, <clears throat> but also persistence and tenacity almost to, to keep on going. <clears throat> by and by we soften we really do and softening is one of the great things about a human being to soften into the truth to soften into kindness with ourselves with others And so the cliff, by and by, starts to melt into the ocean. And there is a tipping point, and there is a time when, is my experience anyway, when the cliff finally just releases into the ocean and something significant happens. But it's not the flash bang of instant enlightenment in that sense. It's more a subtle, it's more a subtle shift, almost imperceptible. But resistance is finished. Uh, A certain resistance to life comes to an end because so much of this is wrapped up in resistance to what is, as I keep saying, video after video. <laughs> and as the cliff falls into the ocean, resistance, you know, the tight fist of resistance at least comes to an end. And there's a deeper equanimity and a deeper grace and a deeper surrender and a deeper softness and a, 
a sort of a humility. But again, you know, it's not an arrival at a place that, oh, now I've, you know, melted into the ocean and now there's nothing more to do as such. Yes, there is, because there's living from the melted place. Yeah, living from that place, living, living the truth, and where where it kind of meets the human experience, where it meets other people, where it meets the body, where it meets relationship, where it meets going into the store, where it meets in all of the multitude of aspects of the human life as it comes up. It's a living truth, that's why we keep saying this is, you know, not a fixed, sterile, static place of great, you know, I've arrived at some, you know, grand place. No, this is a living, walking, breathing, you know, intimate truth with one's human experience. It's just that it is different in the sense that it's more intimate. It's more rooted in awareness. It's more kind of able to listen, really listen, both to within and to without, you know, to, to what's going on inside and to what's going on outside. This is the gradual path, the erosion of the self, not the waiting demanding instant enlightenment and when I don't get it I'm gonna be pissed off and have a sense of failure that you know oh, it's an illusion anyway and uh, I can't do it it's not for me that's not that's not not useful you know what is useful to us really what's useful is our capacity to meet all experiences in the way that we you know, in a way that's deeper than the habitual reactive self. That's what's useful. And then when that goes apparently wrong, or we slip back or we fail, then we to see, see the failure as an indicator, see the failure as an invitation to soften, soften even into the failure. Wow, to soften even into the failure that we've lost it. And that way everything kind of starts to fall into the deepest acceptance. And this is the, you know, the, the erosion. This gradually, this erodes all this hardness, all this, you know, cliff face that we've got and by and by uh, a sort of deeper love of what is comes upon us. A grace. Here we go. I talk about grace again. Well, that is the grace. Yeah. 